Hello, my friends. I'm Pearl of Wisdom, and you're listening to my NHL Pearls of Wisdom. And we have been doing some killer trade videos. Patrick Kane, Taves, Miller, uh, and where's Kadri going? Unrestricted free agent videos. Well, we're going to turn things around a little bit and do something we do every year. And we're going to grade every team's offseason moves uh, and then just the team in general. One out of ten pearls we're going to do. And you're going to go down there and tell me what you think about my grading of each team. That's going to be fun. Comment in the comment section and tell me what you think. Sub yourself up. Let me know. I want to hear about it. But we got to get to these quick because I have a tendency to ramble on on some of them. I really love talking about this sort of thing. So let's get to... First, of the, we're going to do about 10 here. Remember, this is totally one take, no editing, no nothing. Because I'd rather spend time talking to you than worry doing all that kind of stuff. Ain't nobody got time for that, right? All right, let's look at Anaheim. Okay, Anaheim Ducks. I really love what, uh, what uh, Verbeek has done here. First of all, I want to look first on... Look at that. He's got three second-round draft picks in the first next year. That is fantastic in the 2023 draft. Those picks are hard to find. It's going to be a super deep draft. And uh, so for that alone, I already give them him high marks. I really like what Papper Beak has done, period. Um, he brought in Frank Petrano, and we'll look at what his uh, where he sits in the lineup and why I like this so much. I love it. I've always liked Frank Petrano. I've been a big fan of him ever since he was back in Boston. I still think he has offensive upside. And at $3.6 million for three years for a guy, as we see, that at one time in Florida scored 24 goals. And if you look at the prorated for his last couple of years, he, he played lower in the lineup all the time in Florida because they were so deep. He would have been a 20 some 25 goal scorer. This is a guy that can score 25 goals for you every single year. And he goes to the Rangers after being buried in Florida and he gets eight goals in 22 games. Jeez, that's like a 30 goal pace. And I would not su be surprised if F Frank Petrano pulls off a 30 goal season, to tell you the honest truth. 13 points in 20 playoff games. Not too shabby, I would say. Um, so I like the move. I think it's pure value, to tell you the honest truth. Try to get a 25-goal scorer out there for $3.5 million right now. I don't think you're going to find it. And Ryan Strom, uh, there was a lot of talk that he, he was asking for something like seven, and most people had a feeling that that likely wasn't going to happen. But for a short-term contract that has no no-trade clause, until 2027, so like five years, he's going to be 33 years old. This is a guy that can play many positions and do. He's like a he's like a utility player. He can play up and down the lineup. He has enough passing skills to play up in the top, like he or second line, like he did with the Rangers. He's good enough defensively. He can play in your third line, and he can play center, and he can play wing, and. As the young players start to move up here, they can move him off for some picks too because he, has, he doesn't have a no-trade clause. I love it. It gives him so many options. Same as Vetrano too, by the way. So let's see where they fit. Uh, 50 points. What do you have? 54 points last year. 59 two years before that. Now, he was playing with Panarin, so it's going to be interesting to see what kind of point production he can keep up now that he may not be playing with, you know, a Panarin type. I don't think he's going to be on Zegras's line. That is reserved for Terry. So, let's look at the depth chart and what they... And, and we're not done with... We'll also talk about uh, John Klingberg in a second, too. I'll try to keep this short. <clears throat> um... The lineup as it stands, Adam Henrique, Zegers, and Terry. Adam Henrique, he's a little high as far as captain is concerned based on his production, but he's a great room guy, fantastic. 
Comtois, Strom, and Bertrano. That's not a bad second line. And to tell you the honest truth, it has a lot of possibilities. Comtois is only 23. He's big. He fits well in that, you know, that line to go out in the go in the corners and get him the puck and all that kind of stuff like that, especially for a guy like Frank Vitrano. Strom and Vitrano played together already. But what I like about it most is that Mason McTavish here on the third line. If he can get up to the second line, if he can start putting up production that he's able to play on the second line, but Toronto can easily play both sides. I've seen him play left. He scored 25 playing left. He scored 20 playing right. Like, I actually think he's better as a left winger, to tell you the honest truth. So they could put him over on the left with McTavish and bring Ryan Strom over to the right. He's a good right winger. Really good. And you got yourself a strong second line. Lundestrom goes up into the third. And I think, honestly, this is what is they're looking towards. Because Isaac Lundestrom, he, he could even be a second line. I love, I love him as well. So he has got all the options in the world here. He can trade Ryan Storm if they want. If they hit it out of the park early, like if they start looking like they're a team, they can... You know, keep these guys and just build around them until maybe a young guy bounces them out. And then, of course, you got John Klingberg, um, who was on my John Klingberg trade video, if you remember correctly. I did have Anaheim as one of the teams he could possibly go to. And a lot of people said, you know, why would Anaheim do that? They're rebuilding. And my answer was that I could see them signing him because John Klingberg in this cap world might not get his long-term contract that he wants, mostly because his numbers in Dallas were not spectacular uh, as far as offensive defensemen are concerned. And I think he thinks he can be a point-of-game player. Now, whether he can or not, I don't know. But he didn't come close to it in Dallas. And I know that in Dallas, especially under bonus, they played a very deep, no-risk system, defensive system. In Anaheim, you got a much more offensive type game here. And he's probably going to have some opportunities to put up some points that he thinks he can do. And then he can go to the league afterwards if he wants to and say, I told you so, told you. And he can get a better contract. Maybe with Anaheim. But the thing is, is if they're not in a playoff spot come the trade deadline, they can use him for at least a first round pick and get another pick in 2023. All of these moves give them options depending on how much, how fast they progress. And that's why I really love the moves that they did in Anaheim. As far as uh, picks are concerned, uh, they got Nathan Gaucher at uh, number 22 in number in the 22 spot. And I think that's a pretty solid pick. Didn't they get uh, – yeah, Pavel Mintiukov. Excellent pick. I love that pick. I had him higher than this. And I think it was one of the one of the best picks of the draft. So after seeing all that, I'm giving them a nine, and that's higher. That's high for me. I really love the way Pat Verbeek is building this team. I think he's doing much better than his predecessor. He's really looking, taking things, looking at things outside of the box, and giving himself options all over the place. So I give the Ducks a nine. What do you guys think out there in Anaheim land? What do you give your General manager, from 1 to 10, pearls, what would you give them? Comment, sub yourself up and comment in the comment section. Let me know. Arizona, I'll probably be fairly quick with this because <clears throat> they didn't really make too many moves. And really, the thing that they should be judged on, or, you know, uh, if you're going to give them a score ranked on, is draft picks. Because that's what their whole plan was. That's what Bill Armstrong wanted to do. Now, he's a little light in the 2023 picks, which is a super deep draft. But I think what he did was he realized that 
it was going to be hard to wrestle those picks away from uh, other managers out there. So he said, you know what? We're in a hurry. We're not going to be relevant for quite a few years now. Give me your 2024s and 25s. And he also had a lot of 2022s. And that's what he did. He's already got four second rounders in 2025. He's got... the Arizona has... Nine picks already in the first three rounds in 2024. And he's still got time to accumulate more. So for that, super high marks. Because that's what they want to do. As far as the draft is concerned, and that's going to be the big thing, they got uh, Cooley, Logan Cooley. And it's going to be debated for a while because they, they basically let Wright go. And uh, they took Cooley instead. And that's going to be debated for a long time. Um, I personally, I, I, don't, I don't really know which one. Because I heard attitude problems that are right. Like serious attitude problems. I, I've heard it over and over and over again. In which case, I can see how they passed on him and went with Logan Cooley. But that being said... Logan Cooley, to me, is a pretty small forward um, that really didn't put up huge numbers in the American Hockey League until, not like, not AHL, but the U.S. Uh, development program, until last year. And now he is, uh, you know, but I've heard from so many scouts that I really do trust and believe in that he's going to be a, a cracker of a player. So I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and say they did a good job in taking Logan Cooley, but we're really going to have to see on that. There is one move that they made that I'm going to give them very high grade for as well, and that is picking up Zach Cassian from the Edmonton Oilers. I believe they got a pick attached to that as well. And the reason why is Zach Cassian on the ice is, is not really that great anymore. But what Zach Cassian is, is a guy who's been through a lot. He's gone through, he went through rehab, he's gone through uh, substance abuse issues. And his career was almost over, to tell you the honest truth. When he had an accident in Montreal, where he wasn't driving, but he broke his ankle at a party. And the Edmonton Oilers gave him a shot, and he turned his life around. And I think that is huge value to a team that's bringing up some young, bringing up young players uh, for the future. And almost assuredly, in that time, there's going to be guys that you know he can go up and say, "Look, I, I was kind of, I'm a little concerned about the direction you're going. Let me tell you some stories about what it means to lose your career. Like, you know what I mean? So." A well-respected person that has gone through a lot that I think can help young players super quite a bit here. Not only that, on the ice, he's willing to back it up. He's willing to protect young guys that are getting abused and crap. So I, I like that deal. <clears throat> I like that move. And they got Connor Geeky. That was the other one. Drafted 11th. I am on the fence about this one as well. Um, he wasn't my favorite player. Uh, I... I, he, I know he's got size, and after getting Cooley, they're probably looking, hey, you know what, we better get some size in this lineup. I just think that his overall upside might only be a fourth liner, to tell you the honest truth. His skating isn't that great. He's not as physical as you would like for a big guy. He is very raw. It's going to take a while for him. And I just think that there might have been some other players that, in that spot that would have been better sooner for Arizona. But, so that being said, I'm giving Arizona 7.5 pearls out of 10. 7.5 pearls out of 10. Um, not not terrible. Not super high. Not as high as you like to see. But this team is kind of really bad. And it's going to be a bottom dweller. It's hard to give a high marks even though i think that bill armstrong has done a lot of good stuff here and overall down the road 
I think that this team is going to be probably pretty fantastic. But as of right now, I'll stick with that. Oh, I forgot about Troy Stetcher and Mark and, and Patrick Nemeth. Those are guys that they can probably pull off picks at the deadline. And they probably got picks for them. So not a, not bad at all in that regard either. Uh, they're not great on the ice, really. Stetcher's not bad, but he wouldn't be in the top four. Stetcher has basically gone to bottom dwellers, bottom teams his whole, his whole career to keep on getting a relatively good paycheck. But if on a, on a solid team... Solid defense. Stetcher's like a seventh defenseman. So that's my take on Arizona. Tell me in the comment section what you think of that, yo, guys. All right, Boston Bruins. And uh, this is one of the first bad scores that I have. Uh, okay, we'll look at, well, first we'll look at some of the moves that they made. They go out and get Pavel Zaka. Uh, from New Jersey. And Pavel Zaka has struggled in New Jersey. I can't say it any other way. He especially has struggled as a center. And 36 points in 70 games. He was a very high draft pick, sixth overall. Now Boston is picking him up. And I imagine thinking that they're going to, you know, have the right cocktail to put this guy together and give him, give you know, maybe he can come a second line center. And that was the other thing. New Jersey was having a difficult time signing him, and a lot of it had to do with his, he seemed very unhappy that they weren't playing him as a center. He wants to be a center. But the truth be told, he plays better as a winger. His, his hockey IQ, to me, is not high enough to be a center. So more than likely, he's going to play wing. And they lose Hala. Like, I don't mind the deal, really, itself. Um, it's worth a shot. But it's really, that's what I want to say here. It's a worth a shot play. And it's, it's sort of like saying, we're going to get younger, but we're still trying to win. And whenever a team is in that mode, it usually doesn't go well. Uh, you can't have, <clears throat> they haven't signed Bergeron, but I am positive that they will. Uh, I'm not too concerned about that. There's rumors about Krejci. I'm not sure if that'll happen or not. But if you were to, then I suppose this team would be all right. Krejci's 38 years old. He's not going to come in and save this franchise by any stretch. Um, they're going to be without Marshawn, and they're going to be without McAvoy to start the season. So it's going to be a rough haul early. But that was the biggest move. And honestly, I'm giving them a low score because I think it's just like enough already. Enough already. You're not good enough, okay? You are not good enough to beat the Tampas, the Colorados, maybe the Rangers, maybe Carolina. Like... It's just not. It's time to, it's time to break this up, man. And they're not doing it. So, Connor Carrick, really? No bio to Forbert. I, I I just don't see where they did anything too significant to become a contender by any stretch. There's still time, I suppose, but. Where is this team going? It's going nowhere, as far as I'm concerned. Sorry to tell you that, Boston fans. What do you guys think? Tell me in the comments section. Uh, do you agree with me that, you know, Charlie Coyle's got to go? These guys have got to, they got to move on here now, I believe. I believe that they have to move on from this lineup. Bergeron, just say, look, man, it's time to retire, dude. You know, maybe that's the case. Come back, but we got to start getting assets for for players here and moving on and becoming, you know, it's a rebuild time. Face it. Face it. Hampus Lindholm, what was that pickup all about? Uh, it's not bad because I don't, he doesn't have a strong no movement clause, or does he? 
15 team. It's going to be hard to trade him, but, you know, that, he just signed a contract that should be traded. So I got to, I'm giving him three pearls. I, I just see nothing in here, these moves, that makes him a serious contender by the end of this year. All right, next. <clears throat> Buffalo Sabres. And they didn't do many, much for moves this year. And I think I'm giving them kind of high marks for that because there was no reason to. This team still needs to see what a lot of players are going to be. Is Tage Thompson going to, going to do it again? At 24 years old, he scored 38 goals. Can he do it again? Is Jeff Skinner going to keep on actually being a player? Because we know Jeff Skinner. One good year, bad year, good year, bad year, bad year, bad year. Like, so inconsistent. Where's Preyton Krebs going to be? Where's Casey Middlestat moving up to now at 23 years old? There is a lot of questions. I mean, it's a bright light questions. Like, there's a, it, it looks good. It's, they certainly look better than they have in the last decade. They got a beautiful defense with Samuelson, Darlene Power, Yoki Haru, and they did bring Ilya Lyabushkin which I think was a fantastic move. Um, <clears throat> strong defensively, fills that solid, yeah, fits really well, I think, with Jacob Bryson. I think their defense is absolutely unbelievable. I think Eric, I really do. Unbelievable young defense. This defense could turn out to be the best defense in the league. In fact, I would be surprised if it doesn't become the best defense in the league, believe it or not even with McCarr having in Colorado. Eric Comrie, signing Craig Anderson back, cool story, I guess. I mean, he doesn't want to play too much. Giving Eric Comrie a chance to be a number one goaltender is awesome. At this stage of their development in Buffalo, they can take a chance like this, and I think he's very much worth taking a chance on. At $1.8 million, <clears throat> I mean, my gosh, that was a beautiful value for a guy who put up some seriously good numbers last year in Winnipeg and has been building for a long time. He's at that age where goaltenders have a tendency to start becoming what they can become. A lot of, you know, a lot of goaltenders are late bloomers, and he's one of them for sure. And I think it, I think it was a great move. Uh, the very few moves they did, I really liked them. But here's where I give them huge props. Matthew Savoy... Getting him at that spot in number nine is good. I, if people, uh, uh, from what I understand, Savoy could be anything like possibly like a Strom or a Trocheck or something like that up the middle. Not a bad, not a bad pickup at nine. I think they'd be very happy with that. And then they went and got Noah Oslin. Now I don't know if you guys know who Gravite is. He's one of my favorite draft guys now. I, I've been watching a long time, ever since I started doing videos, actually. And he had Oslin high, high, high. Like, top seven high. And the last time he had a player that high where he went, where the consensus didn't have him that high, was Anton Lundell in Florida. Woo! Imagine that. If he turns out to a Lundell-type player, they're going to have so many centers, they're not going to know what to do with them all, for the love of God. Anyways, with the draft and everything and the moves they made, I don't think they really made any wrong, poor decisions. Oh, except for Victor Olofsson. I'm knocking him down for that. I don't get that. But I will say this. Victor Olofsson's terrible defensively. Not a great 5-on-5 five -five guy. He's mostly a power play specialist. But... I think him and Darlene are very good friends. And I think they, for for a couple of years, you sign the guy up until you got to pay Rasmus Darlene. It just makes Rasmus Darlene a little more happy, right? And uh, it's a feel-good thing. You get to sign Darlene. You do not not want to sign Darlene. You got to sign that guy up. I would get him up, sign him as fast as possible. For eight years, nine million, like right now, I would do it. <clears throat> and having a guy like Victor Olofsson there might give him more of a chance to do that. 
That's why I think it is. But really, I think it's an overpayment for a guy who's what, scored 20 goals. He's He's got a great shot, but he has a hard time getting into the spots. He's not great defensively. So I docked him a little bit for that, and I gave them eight pearls for the season, Let me, for the off season. Tell me what you think, Buffalo fans. Eight pearls, good enough. If I missed any other moves and stuff that they did, let me know in the comment section as well. I do this completely on the fly. And now we're going to get into one that's going to raise the ire of a few people, I'm sure. <laughs> This is the debate above all debates here, really. They lose Goudreau. Calgary Flames. They lose Goudreau. They lose Kachuk in different circumstances. They don't get anything back for Goudreau. Personally, I was calling them to trade Goudreau two years ago. A year and a half ago, actually. It was about there. I, I just... I've got to a point now where if I'm an owner or a general manager, if, you, if you're coming up to restricted free agent and you're not willing to sign within a year and a half of that deal, I'm trading you. Forget it. No humming and hawing, and blah, blah, blah. I want to see. No, sorry. I'll give you a fair deal. We'll work out something where we think you're going to be by that time. I may take a few risks there, but you're not going to lose somebody for nothing. So that alone was low marks already for me and there's other factors that stop that from happening sponsors and all that stuff like that i realize that but the fact is that's what happened kachuk there was rumblings about kachuk i did a trade kachuk video last year because uh a very good uh o'brien on serious radio who doesn't even talk about this insider stuff too much. He said that he heard a, a little birdie told him that he may not be in Calgary and that was enough for me. You know, an American and it just kept on. The rumors never stopped. They could have trade got way more for him. And you say well they got a lot for him. Okay. Well, let's look at this. They got Jonathan Huberto. And I've had this argument with people on Twitter all day. Okay. Jonathan Huberto they got When they traded to Florida, they got Jonathan Huberto and Mackenzie Weger. Mackenzie Weger, I'm not even going to argue that. It's a beautiful move. I don't know what he's going to sign for, but I don't know why he got undervalued in Florida. He's a top two winger, and he can play the right side. Boom. Nothing wrong with that at all. I think that's going to hurt Florida just as much as Jonathan Huberto, maybe even more in the long term. Hear me out. Yeah, he's a great offensive player. I'm not going to argue with that. Huberto is a fantastic offensive player. But all I hear is, like, Kachuk's not a great skater. Well, let me tell you this. Huberto's not a great skater. He's 29 years old. They signed him. He signed for one more year, and then he gets 10.5. So he's going to be 38 by the end of this contract. These contracts usually don't end well. You already know that. He had a career year, although, I mean, previous years he didn't play the full 80. This is the first, the last two years before this, not his first year. This is the last two years before this he's had, had some injury issues and stuff, but he did put in a full one this time on a contract year. Or sorry, oh, just a year before a contract year, I should say. 115 points, can't deny. One of the best passers in the league, can't deny it. He's not great defensively. Um, and I know Calgary fans are going to say, well, Matthew Kachuk is not great defensively. Sorry, you're wrong. You're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. This is the, uh, I. you're wrong. He is amazing defensively. And... If you want, comment in the comment section, and I'll post you some stuff to show you that he is amazing defensively. He's not a great skater, but neither is Stone in Air, in, in Vegas. And he's amazingly defensively, amazing defensively. The coach that you have there in Calgary will tell you, you don't have to be the greatest skater to be great defensively or offensively. 
You, it's all about puck movement men and positioning. That's how you do it. You can actually be a fast skater and still be crappy defensively. There's tons of them. Patrick Kane, for instance, is one of the worst defensive players on six, uh, five on five as a top six forward in the league. You know, it, it's not all about that. It's about what you're willing to do and how smart you are, your hockey IQ. Kachuk's hockey IQ is through the roof. He's going to, I would, at, at his age, I would take him at 9.5 over Huberto at 10.5 all day long. I think Florida did very, very well. Mackenzie Weger, excellent move. I like it. Now, I'm going to give a, they were, they were put in a tough situation, but it's a situation they should have known was coming. They should have known this was coming. They could have got more value from both of these players much earlier than they did, and they didn't. As it turns out, they seem surprised by it, and they get Uyghur and Huberto. <clears throat> so I'm not going to give them a crushingly bad mark for what they did because they did kind of unbury them, themselves a little bit. But if you look at this lineup, here's the thing. Is this team truly a contender now? Elias Lindholm, overrated defensively. He's overrated defensively. I don't like the people that vote for the Selkie. I swear to God, they I don't know what they look at half the time. Just sometimes I wonder if they actually watch the games. Just look at the fact that he has a high faceoff percentage. I mean, Kachuk carried that line both ways. Goudreau did offensively. Kachuk did both ways. Lindholm was in the middle of them. Goudreau became a lot better defensively under Sutter. Uh, and now you've got Huberto, who isn't very good defensively, and Elias Lindholm has got to prop him up. Tyler Toffoli's not the greatest defensively either. I mean, I, I think this could end up very bad for Calgary, to tell you the honest truth. I don't think you're going to see what you think you're going to see out of Calgary. I think it's possible they're not in a playoff spot. But more than likely, because of the defense that they put together, Resigning Nikita Zadorov was great. He's a fantastic defensive defenseman. Getting Uyghur was great. I mean, that that defense is it could save them. We'll probably keep them in the playoffs. But they're a bubble team, probably. And maybe one, two year rounds and you're out. And that's not what you want. Now, they do have cap space, I believe now. <clears throat> Especially next year. They can start adding to this roster. And it may turn out okay for them. Oh, 2.7 mil. So they don't have huge cap space, but they do have some. And next year, things change. You got you got some guys coming off the books. Uh, you got to have to give Uyghur money. I don't know. I don't see a team here that can compete against the Colorados, even Edmonton Oilers. They're not a cup team. And for my money, if you're not a cup team, Signing Huberto to ten point five million is not what you're supposed to be doing. They, I would have flipped him, grabbed picks, flipped, maybe maybe keep Uyghur because he's young, and kind of did a rebuild here. That's what I would have did. But anyways, I don't have to answer to sponsors and owners who want to make the playoffs every year to make the money work. So I give them five, five pearls, boys and girls. That's what I give the Calgary Flames. What do you guys give? Calorie for the moves that they did. <clears throat> and I know I'm going to get thrashed for whatever I just said here, but that's okay. You can do that. You can do that. Comment in the comment section. You can call me everything, but whatever you want to say. I am not hurt by things. Uh, whatever says, whatever we, whatever, you know the term, whatever happens on the ice stays on the ice. Whatever happens in the comment section stays in the comment section. I love you no matter what, even if you're mad at me because I said some things or you think I'm stupid. I'm cool with that. I've been called an idiot more than you could possibly imagine doing these things. And I still talk to everybody that calls me an idiot. <laughs> All right. Next, Carolina Hurricanes. Uh, I What did I give him? 9.5. This is beautiful. Pacioretty for nothing. Now, it might only be for one year, but who cares? They, do, they gave nothing. Futures. 
Like one day maybe I might give you a late pick or something. Unbelievable. Beautiful. They wanted that. They needed that. They needed a veteran guy. Now, the one thing I will say is Pacioretty kind of badmouthed Vegas on his way out. And he did the same thing to Montreal. He kind of comes off as an arrogant jerk. I could be wrong about that. Tell me what you think. If you're a Vegas fan listening here or, you know, other people, what do you think about Pacioretty? But you can't deny his production. The guy's a point-to-game winger. Possibly a 40 goal. Now, the other problem is, of course, injuries. Injuries have been piling up for Max Pacioretty. But I still think it's, uh, I still think he's solid and for nothing. Why not? Uh, then, of course, the beautiful move for Burns, which they gave up virtually nothing as well. And, uh, I love it. I mean, he's going to be there a while. He's only making five million. The guy just consistently puts up points. And he did so on a San Jose team who's not as stacked as his Carolina team is. Like, I think he could end up putting up big points again. And he got slave and playing with them. So, yeah, Burns is a, kind of a dumpster fire defensively. But his offense more than makes up for it. And with Jacob Slavin there, if anybody can support his defense, it's Jacob Slavin. So, and then Shea, Pesci, Bear, nice. They got Coglin too, in the deal. <clears throat> like, unbelievable. Coglin's not a bad kid. Probably in that spot. He's a right defenseman, too. They've got an overabundance of right defensemen in Carolina now with, after making all these moves. So... Yeah, I gave him a 9.5. And I'm not even done yet. They got uh, Gleb Trigazov, who I really love in the draft, and Prevalov. They went for Russians in the draft, which was great because you were going to get the most value out of Russians. Because of the whole Russian situation that was going on there. That's not going to go on there forever. <clears throat> Most of these guys aren't going to be ready for a while anyways. It was brilliant. Take the value on these rushers that would have went way higher if it wasn't for that. And then Scott Morrow. Or sorry, uh, that's not. No, that, that wasn't. That, those, are the, those are the two. That, so I loved it. Like usual, they draft well, everything. Uh, I just love what Carolina does. I give them a 9.5. Tell me what you think, guys. 9.5 for Carolina. Do you love the moves that they did? Pacioretty, like you could resign him. Maybe not. It doesn't matter. You know, you can move on from him and just do something else next year. But he helps this year. Burns, I swear to God, I, I think he's going to be not too bad all the way up until he's 40. Like, beautiful moves at the right time is what Carolina does, and I gave them big, big 9.5. Next, Chicago Blackhawks. And man, oh man. I gave them two scores here. <clears throat> I gave the Blackhawks organization <coughs> a one because of all the crap that these players have had to go through. They're fumbling of their rebuild all through this whole thing. Of course, the whole scandal stuff and the way they handled it and all that kind of stuff like that. They put their general manager in an extremely difficult place here, I think. And um, so I gave two scores. I gave one to the general manager as well. Trading to Brinkat. Trading... Um, <clears throat> Uh, Doc to Montreal, getting first round picks. Okay, I know people are going to slam them. You didn't get enough back for Dubrinka. <clears throat> Let me say this Dubrinka is a restricted free agent. There's a, I think there's a very good chance he didn't want to be in Chicago anymore. And there was also, he's at that age level at 20, he was at that age level at 25 years old where. People trading for him would have to know he's going to sign long-term. 
And if they weren't, they weren't going to give much. And so he could have just said, look, this is where I'll go for long, long term. If that list was small, they're not going to get much back for him. And they, that's what happened. And they ended up getting a first <clears throat> who turned out to be a very, very, very good player in Kaczynski. I, there's a, a lot of very good, knowledgeable draft guys that thought Kaczynski could be as good as Sanderson in Ottawa is going to be. And if that's the case, they didn't do too bad. It's going to be okay, but we don't know. But I want to give that out there that, that, so they're going to say, well, why are you trading them anyways? Because after all the crap that went down that I just gave the organization a one for, there is a really good, it's, and Buffalo did this too. They traded a whole bunch of people away to get rid of the darkness of the last 10 years. And I think that's kind of what this is as well. You're trading away players to kind of forget about all that and start anew and all of those sort of things like that. And to suck for Bedard. Everybody knows it, right? If you're going to suck for Bedard, you better suck for Bedard. And that's what they're doing. Now, they got Patrick Kane and Tay still there. That's the other thing. You trade those guys away, it's like, Okay, you get it? You know what kind of rebuild we're doing here? We don't have to tell you. It's like, these guys should have been gone a long time ago. They paid them a lot of money and they keep on holding on. Now, that being said, they got families. I should probably have a little more sympathy. You have a family. You love Chicago. You have the no trade clause, no movement clause. You have every right to stay there. But honestly, what this, what uh, Davidson did here, it's Davidson, right? Uh, yeah, Kyle Davidson. What Kyle Davidson did here should have been done a long time ago. Just bare bones slaughter the crap out of your roster and say, oh, yeah, we're not going to tell Kane and Taze that they're going to go. They they got to ask for a trade. But we are going to make it so you want to get traded. And I think they're probably going to get traded here. And I actually do like the moves because – it, you, if you're going to suck, suck hard. Now you can say, okay, we could have built around to Brinkett and Doc. Right, but those two guys are probably going to make sure you don't get Bedard next year. And when you, if Chicago gets Bedard next year, they're not going to care about I As much as I love to Brinkett, they're not going to care about those guys. We're talking about a guy who probably is a, it might be a better shooter than Matthews, if you can believe that. This guy is in the McDavid territory of player. If you can get him, man, and change the whole energy of this whole team, I think you got to do it. Um, and now they're in a position, they're, they're more and more in a position as they get rid of people, as they move people on, that they can start taking on contracts, getting more draft picks. And doing this build as it needs to be done. And I know it sucks. I mean, Chicago fans right have had a lot to go through in this last little while. And it really sucks to wrap your head around the fact that you're going to suck for a long time. Jake McCabe, Connor Murphy, gone, gone. That, that, they got to get rid of them as well. Anyways, because of the night, you know, a good drafting of Frank Nazer. And Kevin Kuczynski, that's what I know most about. I'm not sure about all the other picks that they did. But I really love the Kuczynski pickup. Uh, yeah, he got drafted seven. So right around the wheelhouse. You're going to love him, man. You're going to love that kid. I gave Chicago the GM a seven. Um, and I almost feel like i got to go higher. I think I'm just giving him a seven because this team's going to suck so bad that – it's hard to give somebody more than a seven, you know, just because of that. It's not really his fault, but I gave it a seven anyway. Seven pearls out of ten. And we're going to go to Colorado now, and I think we'll end her there. Colorado Avalanche. Um, believe it or not, I did not give them a super high score. 
And it's simply because I just can't wrap my head around Gorgia being good enough, man. I just can't. I could be totally wrong here. Uh, you you got to think. Like, last year, they did win the Cup with some of the worst goaltending that a playoff team has had. Not, like, through his whole career, but during that playoff point. Kemper was not that great. He wasn't. He was average at best. Uh, I think might be the worst goaltending that that I've seen and a team still wins a cup. And now you're getting Gorgiev, who was hot ass last year. He was horrible. Having a... T- t- oh, you said, well, those numbers aren't that bad. <coughs> Their defense was great last year. And Gorgiev, kept, he let bad goals in all over the place. So they have to see something in Gorgiev that I don't. And... I mean, they, their goaltender coaches are NHL caliber and all that kind of stuff like that. So I'll give them the benefit of the doubt, I suppose, but not on the score. I, I just I just think it was a really bad move. And they didn't do much else besides that. Uh, they're not bringing Kadri back, which is understandable. Um, you have – I think Alex Newhook is going to be a beast, dude, as close as next year. Like maybe every bit of bit, a bit as good as Kadri or better. So I'm not going to dock too much for that. I, you know, re-signing Josh Manson, I think that's a little rich. He's, he's gone downhill quite a bit, and he's probably going to go downhill even more defensively. He gets far too much credit for his defense because he beats people up. He was an amazing defensive player, but he has gone downhill quite a bit. However, you won the cup with them. I think it's a rich contract. I, and I've never given Sackick a low score for anything. He's a genius. Absolute genius. But I need to see this. And he may come out looking like a genius. And uh, you can all come on the comment section and say, see, Sackick knows. And I'd be like, yeah, yeah. you're." I mean, he's Sackick. It's hard to criticize a guy who built this roster this is a roster that's been built. Every single one of these forwards. I'm not sure about Maltzoff now. Or Magna. Uh, who do they still have to sign? Do they have to sign anybody? Who did they lose there? Tell me who they lost there. What am I missing? Is Helm? No, Helm is back. Anyways, they must have lost some other players that I don't have in here. But every single one of these players are, are two-way beasts. Lekkinen, Landeskog, Ranton, and McKinnon, Nuchushkin, Cogliano, Helm, Newhook, O'Connor, all of them. JT Confer, eh, but still good, average. And I love them for that. And their top three, top four is amazing. It's just what they did this year. I'm not giving them a high mark for, actually. I'm... Uh, I, I really didn't like the Gorgia pickup. I, I think you're really testing the you-don't-need-a-goaltender scenario. Like, Colorado is a major, major analytics-based team. Totally analytics. Like, almost totally analytics. Besides Josh Manson and maybe Eric Johnson, who's been there a long time, this team is analytically insane. And the analytics crew have a tendency to think that goaltending isn't as big of a need as you need. And they won the cup without having spectacular goaltending already. I just think this is taking it too far. Tell me what you think, Colorado fans. My score for the Avalanche for this offseason was 6.5, which is on the lower side of the scores I've given to people out there. All right. That's my full 42. Sub yourself up. I'll talk to you later. I went long, but that's okay. Have a great day, everybody. Okay.